Hello and welcome back to um, Being Fresh Fruit, Be Fresh Fruit. I hope that you have gotten your um, book by now. Um, it is called, once again, Be Fresh Fruit, BFF, if you will. We happen to be on chapter 10, and we are talking about faithfulness. What in the world does it mean to have faith, and what, does it world, what in the world does it mean to have faithfulness? Well, faith is believing without seeing. And you know the scripture for that. So it's kind of like I believe that my light switch will turn on, my computer will turn on, and, and it does. So we're not talking about that kind of faith. We're talking more about being faithful, more about faithfulness. And we are in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. And there it's listed all of the fruits of the Spirit. We have looked at peace, love, joy, kindness, goodness. And now we're moving on to faithfulness. And as you know, if you have your um, copy of your book, there are scriptural studies that you need to do um, in order to prepare for this lesson. I ask that you look at the scriptures in two different versions of the Bible. Yes, one could be King James Version, but then I want you to branch out of the King James Version. Try the ESV, the English Standard Version. Try the um, Good News Bible or the New Living Translation or even the New King James Version. The Amplified Version is really good. We tried it out last class, but um, Go back to Exodus chapter 2 and look at verses 22 and 24. Look at 1 Corinthians 11, 22 through 28. Um, Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 5. And see what in the world faithfulness is. How would you define it? And how would God describe it? And how is God faithful to us? There's some questions listed on the pages, probably around page 200. Um, the book is still in print right now, so I haven't got my final edited copy. So I would say it's about page 200. And so we have talked about before that these characteristics or these virtues, these fruits of the Spirit are um, from the Creator. When we are saved, sanctified, and set apart, we exhibit these character traits because the Holy Ghost lives inside of us. And as we mature, these also mature. And as people see this maturedness from us, they see God. And we can all glorify God in the work. And that's what it's all about, glorifying God so that all mankind is drawn to Him. This is how we get our loved ones saved. This is how we're not a hypocrite. This is um, one of the ways in which we can show the world and be a witness that stands up for faith and that stands up for Jesus Christ and that tells the truth. But part of faithfulness is done over and over and over again. For example, let's consider marriage. Now, marriage is described in the scripture as female and male, joining together under God in one accord, becoming one flesh. That is not my rules. That is God's rules. And since it is God rules, God's rule, then I have to abide by it. My husband and I have been married for 26 years, almost 27, and we have both been faithful to each other. And now what does that mean exactly? Well, intimately, meaning we do not have one of these open marriages. It's not biblical that we have an open marriage. Um, it is a monogamous partner that only um, two people um, together. And in, in that way, we have been faithful. We have also been faithful to each other that when I've been sick. He's been right there. When he's sick, I'm, I'm right there. We're loyal to each other. Um, we have integrity. Um, we are dependable. We are reliable. And we just 
we have these attributes every day and this becomes faithfulness. It becomes taking faith um, and putting wheels on it or putting feet to it. And you should be able to count on your spouse. Your spouse should be reliable and it should, he or she should be dependable. And it should be a consistent thing. Um, faithfulness um, in the character of God. What does that look like? Well, I don't know about you, but he's never forsake me. He never forsook me. He's always been there. From beginning to the end, he promises to go with us all the way. He is faithful. Um, looking in the Old Testament, one of the first incidents that comes to mind about God's being God being faithful to his people is there in Egypt. Um, in Exodus chapter 2, we see that Israel was enslaved to Egypt. Um, when you're reading there, you'll find that God heard their cries. God has always been faithful, and he always hears the cries of his people. In fact, we can call him on him 24 hours a day. In fact, the Bible says, pray without ceasing. Um, he's always faithful to hear the cries of his people, and he always answers with a promise. You know, he told Abraham um, that he was going to have a seed, and his seed was going to make a great nation. And boy, didn't that come to pass. He's faithful. He's just. He, he made 10 plagues come upon Egypt there so that the Egyptian Pharaoh would let his people go. He parted the Red Sea and, and his people passed through. What a promise. You know, we have a promise today that when we die, when we take our last breath, when this body is no more, that God is going to come and get us. He's going to take us home to a place that he's prepared in heaven that human hands has not touched with walls of jasper and streets of gold. He is faithful and his faithfulness will uphold and he will make these things come to pass for each one of us. I examined in um, Lamentations a little bit and the song came to mind great is thy faithfulness it might be a great time to stop the video and and sing that into the lord it might be a time to go and search that song out but great is thy faithfulness but morning by morning new mercies i see all i have needed thy hand has provided great is thy faithfulness great is thy faithfulness Lord unto me. This hymn is a direct result from Lamentations. It has to be. Um, shame, um, shame on us for not being there for God always. Chapter 3 of Lamentations is um, written um, when uh, Israel was again in rebellion against God. The people were not faithful. They weren't reliable. They weren't dependable. They depended on themselves. They created their own um, idols. And they were lamenting. They were um, in anguish. Jeremiah was. He was lamenting and he was full of anguish because the Israelites once again were in sin. How many of you have been there? Yes, you've made a commitment to God. But then comes time and you gave in to your temptation and then you begin lamenting. Well, God is there with an advocate called Jesus Christ. His name is Jesus Christ. And he is there to restore you. Sin will take you further than you want to go. And you'll stay longer than what you thought you was going to stay. And it's like a snowball effect. It just kind of starts innocently and will go all the way down. And you'll be in the pit before long. And the only way... Um, you'll have to go is to look up and to remember your faith in Jesus and beloved he will be there but when we are sanctified we're not going to go there anymore when we are set apart for the will of God and we're walking by the spirit instead of by the flesh we want to please that spirit more than we want to please the flesh and these incidents go away you just have to trust me. You just have to trust in the word that this is the way it goes. In the New Testament, 
we have Apostle Paul, and he is a great example of faithfulness. His kind of uh, faith um, was um, of a strong accord. There for a while, he was killing Christians, and then um, God saved him, and he came into the faith, and he never looked back. He was sanctified. He was set apart. He was um, set out to do God's business and to walk by the Spirit and not walk by the flesh. If you need an example of faithfulness or an example of about anything, look in first or in Second Corinthians chapter eleven, twenty-four and twenty-eight, and you'll see what all Paul went through. But still, he remained faithful to God. He never, just like Job, he never gave up on God. He never gave up on um, God's promises um, in his trials, in his tribulations, or in his problems. So why do we? Because we're not faithful. That's why we're not. We're baby Christians, and we never grow up. That's why. If you are wondering why you're weak in spirit and why she knows so much or why he knows so much, it's because they've spent time with the Lord. They have invested time in getting to know Jesus and time in getting to know uh, having a relationship with him. And that is how you grow in these things. That is how you mature. You just don't go to church on Sunday and Sunday night and one more day through the week and expect to grow in God. You will a little tiny bit. But that is not what you need, and that is not what the Lord means by a relationship. Those things help, and those things are necessary. And in fact, God calls us to a church, or he wouldn't have made the church. But Paul remains faithful to God through all of his trials and persecutions. And here's just a few things. There's more written in, in the scripture about it, but three times he was beat with rods. Could you imagine a big rod and somebody beating you with it? Three times that happened to him. Three stonings. He was shipwrecked. Frequently, his journeys brought him to dangers and rivers uh, against robbers and other people that wanted to cause him harm. He had toils and hardships, sleepless nights. He suffered from hunger. He suffered from thirst. He was exposed in all sorts of weathers, weather patterns. He um, didn't have the appropriate clothing. He had suffered from anxiety and pressure from being the church's boss. I don't know about you, but if you've ever tried to run anything in your life, it's stressful. Um, the life of a, a leader is stressful. Stressful. You need to pray for them. Paul knew what it meant to suffer. And all his life, he suffered after conversion. See, our life as a Christian is not always a bed of roses. Jesus is what Jesus' disciples, their lives were not the bed of roses but it is a far more blessed life than to live in the sinful world. And we have a seal of approval from God. And when we get to heaven, man, it's going to be worth it all. And so remain faithful while you're here. How do you remain faithful? Well, you go back to your disciplines. You go back and you look at prayer. You go back and you start praying more. You start talking to God more. You have conversations with the Lord day all day long. You sing unto the Lord. You go to church. You serve in your church. You serve in your community, not for your glory, but for the glory of God. You do what God has commanded you to do. That is your reasonable service. Check out Romans 12, 1. It says that is your reasonable service. We don't have to die for God. God sent Jesus, his son, to do that for us. And so, but while we're here, we need to sacrifice a little bit to remain faithful unto God, even in all of our struggles. I keep touching my screen. I got a new computer, and this one is not a touch screen. And I, and I miss it. Um, God let humanity know about his redemptive plans for us. If you continue reading in the Old Testament, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, you'll see prophecy after prophecy foretelling that Jesus will come. And this is another example of God's faithfulness. I'm going to stop right here and write that. And this is another example of God's faithfulness. Why do you say that? Well, because... 
it came to pass. His, his faithful promise came to pass. And that was it. He sent his son, Jesus Christ. All the prophecies predicted that he would answer to salvation. And we find that the answer to salvation was and is God being faithful to us. And what are we being faithful to wait upon? His return. His return. John 17, 4. John 17, 4 in the King James Version says this. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. At my funeral, I would love to have that on my headstone or in my program. I have glorified thee on earth, Lord. I have finished the work which thou hast given me to do. And Jesus is the answer to the promise. He is the only way to obtain eternal life. Now, since God sent the Father and God the Son are faithful, then we are also expected to be faithful. Take a minute to jot down. To jot down what do you think Christians should be faithful at doing or at being. I'm going to give you a couple lines here in the book to um, write that down. Just a couple lines. We can go over it. What do you think? Yes. You should be faithful at um, your calling. For example, I was um, called to be the card minister. And I like to make cards. And um, there for a while, I'd make them and hide them. You know, I'd just keep a hold of them. I wouldn't do anything with them. And God said, send it so and so. And I was so low down on myself. I'd say, Lord, nobody wants to hear from me. They're not even good enough to sin. They're good enough to make. Well, that's all called excuses. But I was faithful. And I was faithful to do that. So what did God do? He gave me something else to do. And when I got done with that activity, he gave me something else to do. So it's faithfulness in what he has called you to do. If he called you to preach, be faithful in preaching. If he called you to be faithful in teaching, be faithful in teaching. If he called you to be an usher, then be faithful to be an usher. Be there and do it. Have integrity, have goodness, and have faithfulness. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. We said that one already today. Um, we just didn't put the name on it because I knew we were coming to it. But it is having faith in something that you have not seen and something or someone. And that man, his name is Jesus Christ. As Christians, man, all have seen our need for our Savior. We must be sanctified. Sanctification is the second work of grace. Yes, you get it all at the the time. But there is something about when we grow up, we get more. And so that is called the second work of grace. Now God gives us all the conversion. But we mature and we become sanctified and we submit ourselves to the Lord. We die out to sin daily. We choose to do right instead of wrong. We choose to walk by the Spirit and not after the flesh. And so we are being faithful servants. And then if you read the parable in, in Matthew 24, and I give you some um, room here in the book to write down, in the provided space, write down what you think the verse is wanting each Christian to do. The parable is about the master who has servants. Jesus is saying that there is one servant who is good and one servant who is bad. One servant who is saved and one servant who is not one who is faithful, and one who is not. The faithful man receives good, and the bad one will receive judgment. So do you want to be a faithful servant or um, the sinner that receives judgment? Then there is a clause that if the master beats his servant or is unkind to his servants, then the master will come back to punish him. So if you have a job and, and you're the manager and you have um, a bad one and a good one, you're supposed to treat them equally and not um, abuse them in any way. And if you do, then you're going to have to answer to God for doing such activity. 
God will judge us for who we took care of um, and how we took care of it. God is the owner, Jesus is the master, and we are his servants. Therefore, Jesus gives each of us certain responsibilities. This is why Jesus sent the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit helps us um, produce the fruits of the Spirit, and he helps us to know which way to go, which way to turn, what's important in life, and what's not important to li in life. And it is him that we are supposed to be um, serving. It is him that we're supposed to look to. He's the comforter. He's the one that Jesus sent back to help us. Finally, God is our judge. If we do good works and we obey God, he will bless us. But if we do not the will of, of God, then we're doing the will of Satan and he will punish us. There is something called the second death. The ones who are saved under the blood of Jesus Christ will be judged on the Bema seat and will make heaven their home. However, on the flip side, if you are unsaved and you're a non-believer and you are one of the ones that reject Christ, Christ too will reject you and you will be, be cast into the lake of fire at the great throne room of judgment. So finally, the fruit of the spirit characteristic of faithfulness is just not something for spiritual life. It's something that needs to be manifested through us every day. We discussed earlier about being faithful in our marriages, but what else will we be faithful or what else requires us to have faithfulness to? And that is about the last question there on page 220. We need to be faithful in our marriages, staying powers provided through the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost does not like divorce. The Holy Ghost likes reconciliation. The Holy Ghost likes for us to get along and be in unity. We need to be faithful to our finances. A lot of people just buy, buy, buy and want to keep up with the Joneses. That's not being a good steward of God's money. That is um, chasing down a rabbit tail that you should not be going down. It um, gives you too much debt and then you become enslaved to the debt. Hebrews 10, 25 tells us that we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. If you haven't been to church, then uh, my friend, you are in sin. God put us on earth to love one another, to work together, to work in his kingdom. And um, we are reborn into the body of Christ. We are to bloom where we are planted. That doesn't mean you hop from church to church. That means you go to church where God tells you to go and you leave when God tells you to leave. You are to be faithful where he has planted you. Oh, that's a lot in this lesson, isn't it? We only need to leave the body of Christ, that certain church when God directs our paths. Um, we have too many people searching for churches based on where they want to be or where they can serve the best or where they can shine the best and um, where they have the best programs for their children, the best nurseries, the best choir, and that is all good. And um, But God says to go to a certain church and maybe you're called to be the director of those things. But we're supposed to be faithful and everything, not just giving a lip service. Let's go ahead and pray for today. I appreciate you um, watching. If you like this video, or even if you didn't like this video, you want to put down that you liked something about it, because I am a servant of God, and God does not like it when we point out each other's flaws, but he likes us to be encouragers of someone else. So if you would subscribe and share the message, not share it because it makes me look more better or because it gives me more followers or whatever, but share it because it's God's word and that you want others to be saved. That's why I'd like for you to share this video and um, give it a thumbs up and subscribe. But now let's um, go ahead and close out in prayer. Lord God, our Holy Father, I thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to serve you, to fulfill my calling to be a preacher. I have a desire to seek you, Lord, to hunger and thirst after your word. Lord, I have the desire 
Father, that the Great Commission to see one saved. Lord, we just thank you for this message. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that guides and directs us and teaches us and that works through us to produce these fruits of the Spirit. Lord, I ask you to make everyone an expert in the fruits of the Spirit so that more work can be done to glorify you that will ultimately draw our brothers and sisters, our cousins and our friends that are lost into the fold before it's everlasting too late. Lord, thank you for showing up on the scene. Lord, thank you for directing this lesson. Lord, thank you for your sweet, holy presence. Oh, Lord, we appreciate who you are and what you do for us. Lord, we just lift your name up on high today. Father, help us as we go through the day. Let us continue our last few um, chapters here together. Bless each one that's listened, prepared, and done and worked in their books. And in Jesus' name, I pray for those that will come. And we'll also hear the word, maybe through the book. But hear your words. In the name of Jesus, amen.